Hey, Moon here. Today I wanted to take some time to talk about media. So what is media? At its core, it's simply communication. Media can be spoken word, podcast on a screen or a radio, or just words on a page. There are tons of different kinds of media from TV shows and commercials to movies, streaming services, video games, digital printed magazines, newspapers, books. Communication is undoubtedly the most powerful tool we possess. This means that mass media is a very powerful force in today's society, especially in more developed areas of the world. Sociologists call this mediated culture. And mediated has two primary definitions, which is to bring about a result such as a physiological effect and to serve as an intermediary or indirectly connect two or more parties together. This to me means that the media is being used as a conduit to connect people as opposed to people connecting with people. When we consider that culture is created through connection, it starts to seem like different facets of media create their own cultures or subcultures. It's nearly impossible to go anywhere in the developed world without seeing a television, billboard, magazine, or a book. This media doesn't only exist to sell a physical product, but also sells us on specific moods or attitudes. The most important product, though, is surely consensus on what is and what isn't significant or valid. The media tells us what is and isn't appropriate in the subculture that it's supporting. Without mass media, the concept of celebrities or influencers would be much less important. I'm sure in a local area there would still be some well-known local celebrities, but they'd most likely be people with high political or financial standing. Perhaps there would be some well-known outlaws or artists, but not nearly the way that it is now. It's only recently that actors, singers, and social influencers have become household names and achieved stardom. Humans being subjected to large amounts of media intake is seemingly a recent phenomena. It wasn't too long ago that the television only had maybe three stations, public broadcasting and a few local or independent stations, compared to the 500 plus television channels we have now, not to mention all the options for online streaming choices are innumerable. Like any tool though, it can be used to commit wicked deeds. Lately, it seems like someone or something is utilizing the media to subtly sow despondency in the minds and hearts of so many. The wide reach of this tool is a slippery slope because there will be those who take advantage of the power in such a cunning and elusive manner that even suggesting that just maybe some, if not all, mass media outlets have ulterior motives is a cultural faux pas, to say the least. Nowadays, instead of having just a few channels and shows that target a small demographic, we have countless options tailored to all ages, backgrounds, incomes, attitudes, and belief systems. This wider reach of the media makes TV, cell phones, computers the focus or distraction of all different types of people. When it's not television or smartphones, it's books, magazines, or video games. Just as people sink themselves into adventure stories, people fall into news stories, and the dedication to the cause being incited by the media outlets can also render people incapable of communicating with those outside of their subculture. Personally, I think it's never a good sign when a cult mentality breeds fear, disagreement, and suspicion against our own neighbors, friends, and family. I wanted to say that this is prevalent in every subculture. Even in the so-called conspiracy circles, there are instances of canceling. When you listen to something somebody says and you disagree with it, you lose respect for them, which I suppose is a given considering the whole basis of the subculture is, you know, be suspicious and seek the truth. I can't say I'm not guilty of feeling that way myself. I definitely used to feel that way when someone whose work I respected, someone I watched all the time, did or said something I really disagreed with. And I think that's the case for a lot of people. I think that it's very common to admire people in the media, whether big media or independent media. However, and this is key, if we set expectations for anyone but ourselves, we will end up disappointed. No one else on this earth is ever going to have the same exact point of view as you. All of us make some percentage of our choices based on personal experience. And the amount of just one single human's personal experience is incalculable. So the chances that anyone else is going to totally agree with you, even on your most basic values, is very unlikely. Does this mean that people who do horrible things should be left alone? Of course not. 
but it's more common that we judge someone very harshly based on something that they said or did, usually out of context, not based on their character, because that's something you can only really experience through face-to-face -face interaction over a period of time. Nowadays, many of us think we know something or someone based on photos with words underneath them. It's good to listen to where others are coming from because a lot of us do have things in common, just as many things as we don't have in common, probably. It's really up to the individual to decide which things to focus on and how to apply what we learn from others. There are a lot of people that I listen to that I do not agree with on their lifestyle or attitude, but I still really enjoy their content and respect them and learn from them. Do I judge them sometimes? I mean, yeah, a little. But I don't go write it on their page because it's just a fleeting thought in the grand scheme of my life. What I learn from them holds a much higher value than what I don't like about them. I think it's important to remember that, as far as I know, these are just people we're talking about. I think that the disconnect happens when we view a person through a screen and we don't attach it to a real human or even suspect that it's not a human. And sometimes we deify people we don't know and once the idea that we've built of them changes or is shattered, we get irritated or feel betrayed. Especially when it comes to people who are rich or even remotely famous. I noticed that the general consensus is that all rich people are evil or controlled by something beyond our understanding. I do think that it's true that there are rich people who are unfortunately very sick and evil and twisted, but there are people of all incomes, ethnicities, heights, weights, whatever, that fall into this category. Anyone can be aligned with evil. Evil is not picky and will take anyone. But I do think there are more good people in the world, and grouping any amount of people together based on a narrow set of qualities is just unreasonable. We could get deep and say that there are robots or secret agents on the other side of the screen intentionally trying to mislead people. I can't deny that that's a possibility for literally anyone you don't know on the internet, so I think the lesson here is do not connect yourself so deeply to a media outlet influencer or independent media channel to the point where you're hurt or upset by something they say. Putting that much emotional stock into people and stories that we don't actually experience can be fun because there's no commitment, but it can also become damaging if it's too much of a crutch. We could instead just try to have confidence in ourselves and learn from others objectively. It's crazy to think that the masses are now a part of the mass media, making media at an all-time massive. So, how big is the role of mass media in our society today? This has been a hotly contested topic since the invention or reinvention of the printing press. There are a few well-known perspectives on this question. Limited effects theory, class dominant theory, and culturalist theory. The limited effect theory argues that because people generally choose what to watch or read based on what they already believe, the media exerts a negligible influence. This theory originated and was tested in the 1940s and 50s. Studies had that examined the ability of media to influence voting found that well-informed people relied more on personal experience, prior knowledge, and their own reasoning. However, media experts more likely swayed those who were less informed. Critics point to two problems with this perspective. First, they claim that the limit effects theory ignores the media's role in framing and limiting the discussion of the debate of issues. How media frames the debate and what questions the members of the media ask change the outcome of the discussion and the possible conclusions people may draw. Okay, so to me, this is basic communication failure. We have person A in a conversation who is trying to make a point, and then person B is asking questions that do not pertain to the point the person A is trying to make. Um, or asking, you know, person A questions they've already answered on many occasions, proposing explosive accusations, twisting words to frame the speaker in a mediated light. The second criticism is that this theory came into existence when the available and dominance of media was far less widespread. The class dominant theory argues that the media reflects and projects the views of a minority elite which controls it. Those people who own and control the corporations that produce media comprise this elite. Advocates of this view concern themselves particularly with the massive corporate mergers of media organizations, which limit competition and put big business at the reins of media, especially news media. Their concern is that when ownership is restricted, a few people then have the ability to manipulate what people can see or hear. For example, owners can easily avoid or silence 
stories that expose unethical corporate behavior or hold corporations responsible for their actions. The issue of sponsorship adds to this problem. Advertising dollars fund most media. Networks aim at programming at the largest possible audience because the broader the appeal, the greater the potential purchasing audience and the easier selling airtime to advertisers becomes. Thus, new organizations may shy away from the negative stories about corporations, and especially parent corporation, corporations that finance large advertising campaigns in their newspaper or on their stations. Television networks receive millions of dollars in advertising from companies like Nike and other textile manufacturers were slow to run stories on their news about possible human rights violations by these companies in foreign countries. Critics of this theory counter these arguments by saying that local control of news media largely lies beyond the reach of large corporate offices elsewhere, and that the quality of news depends upon good journalists. They contend that those less powerful and not in control of media have often received full media coverage and subsequent support, as examples they name numerous environmental causes. While most people argue that a corporate elite controls media, a variation on this approach argues that a politically liberal elite controls the media. They point to the fact that journalists, being more highly educated than the general population, hold more liberal political views, consider themselves left of center, and are more likely to register as Democrats. They further point to examples from the media itself and the statistical reality that the media, more often than not, labels conservative commenters or politicians as conservatives, than liberals as liberals. I think that by not labeling liberals, um, this is a way to make this way of thought seem like the consensus or majority, um, or to favor one side by framing them as more humane. Um, I noticed that the media only shows evidence of one side's message being framed as wholly loving and urgent, and the radical members of the side are rarely ever filmed or mentioned or broadcast live to the public by media outlets. And oftentimes, a radical left behavior is commended by uh, people with similar desires. Um, when it comes to the conservatives, they are often framed in the position that they are everything but accepting or loving. There are, of course, some not so friendly members of that community. And wouldn't you know, these are the people that the media chooses to interview and give attention to, despite there being plenty of non problematic people who would gladly answer anything uh, the interviewer or media person asked. Uh, some more compassionate leftists might argue that the sane ones are few and far between, but that's, you know, being that's based on the assumption that statistically they are hateful and all the phobics you can think of. Um, now to even be sympathetic towards conservatives is borderline a criminal offense. As it stands, the social norm seems to be that we're just supposed to judge the worth of a group of strangers broadcast to us through a screen in the span of a 10 minute segment. That's how we're encouraged to treat others lately. So no, it's not a lie that there are plenty of radicals on both sides, but the way in which it's presented, how it's presented, and how much, is a conscious manipulation of the whole truth in order to support a mediated outcome. It's similar to taking a picture of someone from a certain angle or dressing someone up to make them look taller or have a larger bottom. So it's really like that person in the picture, just not all of them at every angle. Media language can be revealing too. Media uses terms such as arch or ultra conservative, but rarely ever uses the term arch or ultra liberal. Those who argue that a political elite controls media also point out that the movements that have gained media attention generally support liberal political issues. Predominantly conservative political issues have yet to gain prominent media attention or have been opposed by the media. The culturalist theory developed in the 1980s and 1990s combines the other two theories and claims that people interact with the media to create their own meanings out of the images and messages they receive. This theory sees audiences as playing an active rather than passive role in relation to mass media. One strand of research focuses on the audience and how they interact with the media. The other strand of research focuses on those who produce the media, particularly the news. Theorists emphasize that audiences choose what to watch among a wide range of options, choose how much to watch, and may choose the mute button or the VCR remote over the programming selected by the network or cable station. Studies of mass media done by sociologists parallel text reading and interpretation research completed by linguists. Both groups of researchers find that when people approach material, whether written, text, or media images and messages, 
they interpret that material based on their own knowledge and experience. Thus, when researchers ask different groups to explain the meaning of a particular song or video, the groups produced widely or divergent interpretations based on age, gender, race, ethnicity, or religious background. Therefore, culturalist theorists explain that while a few elite corporations may exert significant control over what information media produces and distributes, personal perspective plays a more powerful role in how the audience members interpret those messages. So all this time, the media has used these studies to protect themselves from being held responsible for events that may have occurred as a result of their broadcasts. The concept I mostly agree with. I'm sure we've all heard the tale of the first broadcast of War of the Worlds, in which countless people took the broadcast for fact, lost their minds as a result. This is now considered to be nothing more than a myth, despite it being taught in school as a factual event. Uh, this event, true or not, acted as a sort of cautionary tale to not always trust what's being put on the airways. So yeah, I guess this sort of rustles my jimmies that now independent content creators are not sheltered by the same studies that mass media uses to protect itself and are penalized by a program that claims to protect people from dangerous misleading content silencing millions. Thankfully this behavior is not going unnoticed and will not go unpunished. The way the media has been operating cannot be sustained. It will be destroyed or die out on its own. As addicting as it is, the human spirit will eventually grow tired of it and strive for the relative peace and quiet that it once had. While I don't have any allegiances to any politicians specifically, it's obvious to me that there is some subterfuge happening. What's the goal? I can't say for sure. I think that the future is very malleable and constantly subject to change. There is such a high information flow these days that deciphering legitimate claims is no easy task. Muddying the waters is a very powerful and manipulative tactic to steer perception. In the name, media is a tribute to a figure from mythology who was very manipulative and cunning. Medea is a character from Greek mythology who is known to be tricky, powerful, and vindictive. Credit of the story is given to an ancient Greek author named Euripides, who is thought of now as a very influential teacher in Hellenistic culture. There was a part of this section of the story that caught my attention. So I'm just going to put the um, whole paragraph on the screen because a lot of these names are very hard to say. So I'm just going to read the little part that uh, stuck out. So. The teeth sprouted into an army of warriors. Medea had previously warned Jason of this and told him how to defeat this foe. Before they attacked him, he threw a rock into the crowd. Unable to discover where the rock had come from, the soldiers attacked and defeated one another. There is of course much more to the story, but that part reminded me of the current entity with the same name who uses the same clever tactics. Here are some more interesting traits that Medea possesses in this story. Uh, she can be manipulative, murderous, self-destructive, devious, vengeful, and downright evil. She even goes as far to murder her own children in order to get back at the father. Now, I'm not saying that Jason was a perfect gentleman or anything, because he definitely wasn't, but Medea got vengeance beyond what any even insane person would consider just. Her obsession with what she considered justice paints her spirits in the eyes of humanity. Although Jason calls Medea the most hateful to gods and men, the fact that the chariot is given to her by Helios indicates that she still has the gods on her side. Just like these gods, Medea interrupts and puts a stop to the violent action of the human beings on the lower level, justifies her savage revenge on the grounds that she has been treated with disrespect and mockery, takes measures and gives orders for the burial of the dead, prophecies the future, and announces the foundation of a cult. The story continues that Medeus, son of Medea, conquers the Iranian plateau and renames it Medes. The Medes were a diverse people but are usually generalized into six tribes. Among those tribes were the Magi, a word familiar to us all by now. These people were said to be shamans who were proficient at talismans and spells and were hired by kings and leaders who failed at obtaining victory through battle or communication uh, to eliminate their enemies in a way that was imperceptible to most. I say hired, but it's possible that some of these Medes could have been forced or manipulated into doing the bidding of their client. I also find it interesting that the Medes lived on a plateau and we've covered in some older videos how it's the history of some cultures that these plateaus or mountains are the remains of giant trees, which not only provided food for their ancestors, but were considered portals to other realms. 
me, this implies that their understanding of this world was likely heightened by their location and upbringing. The possibility that their services were taken advantage of. It's also possible that there was a group of them who branched off and partnered with power-hungry people and used their God-given abilities solely for personal gain. It's no secret that the media casts spells and enchantments. Their methods just ooze trickery and duplicity, vengeance and guile, tit for tat and all that. It doesn't make it any easier to decipher trickery from simply enjoying art, which is at its core deception. The nature of the current zodiacal age is known as both the Age of Deception and the Age of the Arts. This is the dualistic outcome of the overarching energy that is illusion, and it manifests in many different ways. Art, music, film. In a way, they're all lies, illusions created by humans, carefully constructed vignettes of thoughts, stories, or feelings created in a multitude of ways with an endless array of tools. It truly is a beautiful time to be alive, but it's also a very confusing time to be alive. As it stands now, it seems like we are at the end of an age. Whether there will be some dramatic showdown of good and evil, a grudgeable crawl into some new normal, or the spiritual equivalent of a system reboot, who's to say? Maybe it's all set up like some of us like to think, and maybe it's all the work of aliens, robots, or ancient beings. That's an understandable point of view, but even if that's the case in some roundabout way, I don't think that it, it would mean doom. It's just another challenge. We can still learn about all these troubling and disturbing things and remain confident. If you really just don't have any hope at all, then why are you even watching this channel? Why look into something if you genuinely believe it's not going to change anything, just to sit around and scoff at how immature and powerless we are? Speak for yourself. Overstanding is power, and sure, getting information from the true source these days is tough. But it's because we've allowed ourselves to be manipulated into disconnecting ourselves from that source. I think it's clear that the true source is something internal that we all possess and have access to. There's just some baggage that we've picked up along the way that keeps getting in the way. All we have to do is decide to move it from our path. To me, media or any information that doesn't come from inside isn't necessarily evil, because we exist inside and outside of ourselves. The obvious solution is, you know, balance and moderate in intake of media. Don't take things at face value, take everything with a grain of salt. Um, so much information that uh, we can learn from objectively without getting too emotionally connected to it. So that's the gist of my thoughts. This was kind of a mix between um, just me kind of like saying what I think and then showing some information. If you like this style of video, let me know and um, I'd love to hear what you guys think in the comments. As always, a big thank you to anybody who made it this far, subscriber or not. I really appreciate your ear and your time. I realize that these are uh, very confusing and seemingly dark times, but I just want to remind everybody to keep your chin up and uh, keep going because we never know what's going to happen. Thank you. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?